Hello, welcome to another lesson on Make Science Easy. Today we're carrying on looking at scientific literacy. We're going to be looking at advanced graph drawing today. If you've watched the first lesson on graph drawing, this lesson is going to carry on from that and it's going to take your skills even further and make sure you can draw really, really good graphs. If you haven't watched the first video, it's definitely advisable that you go back and you watch the first graph drawing lesson. That's going to outline all of the basics for you. We have a very basic graph here and we're going to plot a scatter graph. And so we're going to be comparing two variables. We're going to be comparing time, which is our independent variable. And we're going to be comparing the volume of hydrogen produced, our dependent variable. So in this particular example, it might be adding magnesium to acid. So metal plus acid makes salt plus hydrogen. So in this experiment, we would just be measuring the amount of hydrogen produced against time. Now, this is a very simplified example. It's here to illustrate how we would draw graphs. The science of the reaction isn't necessarily what we're going to be looking at in this. We can see along the x-axis, we have time plotted because it is our independent variable. Along the y-axis, we've got the volume of hydrogen produced. This is because it's our dependent variable. Also, if we look, we've got the units plotted and we have equal spacing for all of our values. This is really important stuff. So, we're going to plot our points. So we can also see there's a data table, time and volume. We wouldn't normally put our data table on a graph, but it's there to illustrate to you how we do this. But when you're actually drawing a graph, please do not put a data table in. That should be separate. The first point is fairly obvious how to plot. It's going to be our origin. So it's going to go from zero and zero. The other points, we need to plot as accurately as we can. We're going to have to draw a line of best fit for this graph. Now, there are a number of different ways that people try to draw lines of best fit, but only one of them is correct. One of the most common mistakes that people make is when they draw the line of best fit, they try to join every single point together using a ruler. This is not correct. A line of best fit should never join directly from point to point. If you are connecting every single point in your line of best fit, you're not actually drawing a line of best fit for a scatter graph. Another mistake that people often make is they connect the first point of their graph to the last point of their graph and they ignore all other data points. Now this is a slightly better example than going dot to dot, but it is still not correct. And this is because we end up with a skewed set of results. A line of best fit should have an equal number of points above the line of best fit and below the line of best fit. In this example, we didn't have any points above the line of best fit, only below it. The correct way to draw a line of best fit is to draw a line that shows the average trend of the points. This means the line doesn't actually have to go through the first point, it doesn't have to go through the last point, and in fact, it doesn't have to go through any points at all. But we're aiming to have roughly the same number of points above the line and below the line. So for this particular trend, our line of best fit should look like this. Now you'll notice that I have put this line through the origin, through the zero, zero. And this is because we would expect that result. Because if magnesium is reacting with acid, at zero seconds before the reaction has started, a result of zero centimeters cubed of hydrogen produced is a definite result. In this case, it's acceptable to put it through the first point. But that's not always going to be the case. So just be careful. Now, your line of best fit should show a trend of all of the data points. There should be roughly an equal number of data points above and below the line of best fit. If your line of best fit does not have roughly an equal number of points above and below the line of best fit, then it's probably not very accurate. Also, make sure that all data points are treated equally. If you have one data point that is very, very far from the line, don't move your line to meet that one point. Go with the general trend. If 
we take another example and we add some more data points in. It's the same example, but we now have much more data, so maybe we took some repeat results. We need to draw a line of best fit, and again, it's going to be drawn in basically the same way. We're going to have an equal number of points above and below the line. However, this data point is what we call a data outlier, or an anomalous result. It does not fit the pattern of our result at all. Clearly something's gone wrong when measuring this data point, so we ignore it. It's not included at all in our line of best fit. So, data points do not always fall within the pattern of the rest of the data. So these are data outliers or anomalies. So do not consider them at all when drawing your line of best fit. Not all lines of best fit are going to be as nice as the one we've just seen. If we take the same experiment, but we look perhaps at a slightly more realistic example and we change the values for the amount of hydrogen being produced, we can see that what we get is a curved line. This graph is going to plot very differently. People still make some very simple mistakes, however. Again, the most obvious mistake that people make is they try to plot a straight line. They think they can treat this like a straight line graph. The data does not support this. A straight line will not be correct. So not all data supports a straight line. If you have a curved line, then you can use a curved line of best fit. The correct way to draw a line of best fit for a curved line is to draw a curve. And it should look something like this. It's a single curve. The curve doesn't go up or down or change direction repeatedly. It's just one curve in one direction. We haven't taken a ruler and connected every single point. When you're drawing a curved line like this, your line should be drawn freehand. Now the line of best fit does not need to go through every single data point that you have. It only needs to show the general trend. You can have points above the curve or below the curve. And just like with a straight line graph, you'll need to have roughly an equal number of points above or below the line. Just like with a straight line graph, if you have anomalous data, ignore it. Do not include it in your line of best fit. One of the most important things we can include in our graph are range bars. Range bars show us the highest and the lowest points for each set of data. This can be really useful when we come to evaluate our data and we come to look at how reliable it is. Now, the example we're looking at for range bars it's going to be another example of magnesium reacting with acid. Now, in this particular example, we're going to use four repeats. Now, the results are made up, but to illustrate the point of how to draw range bars, that's absolutely fine. We're also going to change it so we have zero grams of magnesium through to four grams of magnesium, and it's going to be reacting with an acid. Now, in most experiments, we have multiple repeats for each value. The reason for this is very simple. One single set of data is not reliable. We don't know if it was a fluke result, if something strange happened, if there was a problem with the method. We need to take repeat results to point out if our results are reliable. If we continually get the same result or a similar result, then our results are reliable. But one set of data is never enough to be certain or to be sure to draw any conclusions. So we collect our data and we fill in the data table and we have it filled in and every single point is to the same degree of accuracy. In this case, it's to two significant figures or in cases where it's less than 10 to one significant figure. There are no decimal places in this and this is fine because it's just illustrating how this works. When you're collecting data, this might not be quite accurate enough, but that's gonna be up to you to decide. The first thing we're going to do with this data is we're going to do some very basic data processing we're going to calculate the mean. If you're not sure how to calculate the mean, I'm going to explain it briefly now, but I also have another video on basic math skills for science which you might find very useful. So check that out. To calculate the mean, we add up all of the data for a single set and we then divide it by the number of data points. So let's take the example of zero grams of magnesium. We're going to collect all four repeats and the data and we're going to add them up and divide them by the number of repeats. 
Now in this case, it's very simple. It's zero, attempt one, plus zero, attempt two, plus zero, attempt three, plus zero, attempt four. Now, just for completeness, I'm going to put these in brackets because when we are doing maths, operations in brackets always come first. So we add these up and we then divide them by four. Now, obviously, zero plus zero plus zero plus zero is zero. And we divide zero by four and shockingly, we end up with zero centimeters cubed. So our mean result for zero grams of magnesium reacting with acid is zero centimeters cubed. I'm now gonna repeat this process, but now for one gram of magnesium. So four plus six plus three plus six. Again, that is in a bracket because I want to be doing the adding up first before dividing it by four. So we add those numbers together and we get 19. 19 divided by four because we have four repeats is 4.75 centimeters cubed. So my result, my mean for one gram of magnesium is 4.75 centimeters cubed of hydrogen produced. We're gonna repeat this process again, but now for two grams of magnesium. Now, if you look at the data we have, one of these data points sticks out. It doesn't seem to match the others. And of course, this is attempt two. We have 24 centimeters cubed of hydrogen being produced but that's double what we had for any other. In fact, it's higher than anything we have for four grams of magnesium. Now this should set red flags up in your head. Alarm bells should be ringing. This data point is not correct. It is an anomaly. When we are calculating averages, we do not include anomalous data. We ignore the anomalous data. We identify it and we ignore it. So this time, we're only going to be dividing by three because we now only have three repeat results to use. Attempt one, attempt three, and attempt four. So it's going to be 12 plus 10 plus nine in brackets because we do our addition first, which is going to give us 31. And we divide it by three because in this example, we've only got three sets of data to divide by because again, our second data point 24 centimeters cubed is an anomaly. So 31 divided by three is 10.33 centimeters cubed. This process then gets repeated. So for three grams, we add them up, we divide them by four, and we get 58 divided by four is 14.5 centimeters cubed. And we repeat it one last time for four grams of magnesium, add everything up, divide it by four, gives us 82 divided by four, which is 20.50 centimeters cubed of hydrogen. So let's have a look at how we plot these range bars. So we're gonna plot our graph just like normal, just like we have done all of our other graphs, but just for simplicity's sake, so you can see what's going on, I've included the data table. Make sure you don't include a data table in your graph, they shouldn't be on your graph, but I want you to be able to see what's going on. So we plot our points as we always would, and we then draw a line of best fit. What we now need to do is to plot our range bars. Range bars, remember, show the highest point and the lowest point. There is no point in showing anything for zero because all of our results are zero. So let's move on to one gram of magnesium. If we look very carefully, we can see our smallest data value is three centimeters cubed. So we need to draw a line, a horizontal line, just below the data point at three centimeters cubed. We now need to find our largest data point. And for one gram of magnesium, it's six centimeters cubed. So above the data point, we draw a ho another horizontal line at six centimeters cubed. We now have our lowest point and our highest point marked on. We now draw a vertical line connecting them and we have our range bar drawn. We repeat this process with two grams of magnesium. Now it's vital to remember because we have an anomaly, we do not include this in our range bar. So we find our lowest value, which is nine centimeters cubed. So we mark on a line at nine centimeters cubed and we find our highest value, which is going to be 12. We mark on another line and we connect them together. We now have our range bar. For three grams of magnesium, our lowest point is 13 and our highest is 17. So again, we connect them. And again, we repeat this for four. So, drawing range bars, we show the difference between the maximum and the minimum results for each data point. 
as I've said earlier, range bars are really useful for evaluation and we'll go through this in another lesson. But as a general rule, the smaller the range bars are, the more reliable our data is because there's not a big difference between our data points. The bigger our range bar is, the less reliable our data is. Another thing that we need to consider and that we need to include in all good graphs are well-scaled axes. We need our scales to be the right size. We need our axes to be the right size. It's a very common mistake to have things scaled poorly. So let's have a look at an example where mass is being lost. We can plot our data points and we can see that we only did the experiment for 50 seconds. Yet the time goes up to 100 seconds. We can also see that the starting mass of marble was about 450 grams and the end mass was about 360 grams. This whole graph only takes up a quarter of the graph paper. So this is not particularly good. The whole of the graph is contained within a small area. We do not want this. A good graph will take up the majority of the graph paper. It's really important to realize that the y-axis does not need to start at zero, especially in this example. A much better starting point would be closer to our lowest value. The x-axis also doesn't need to go to zero, but in this case, zero would make sense. However, there is absolutely no need for the x-axis to go to 100 seconds. We do not have results to 100 seconds. This does not make sense to make it this big. So our graph needs to fit within the whole of the area. Make sure things are scaled correctly. Got the same set of data, we're going to plot it exactly the same way, but let's have a look at the scales. The smallest mass of marble is now 350 grams, so the y-axis starts at 350, and it only goes up to 475. The x-axis only goes up to 50 seconds. Now when we plot our data, we can see that it's contained within our chart area to a much better standard. This chart now shows correctly what we should expect. We don't have all of our graphs squashed up in one small area. It's much better. Make sure your graphs are scaled correctly. So, the same graph is drawn in the same way here. The scaling is improved. It is much better. In summary, lines of best fit must be drawn either as a single straight line or as a single smooth curve line. Not all of the data points need to be hit. So they need to show the general trend. Data outliers and anomalies must be identified, but do not include them when calculating means, do not include them when, count when drawing trend lines, and do not include them when drawing range bars. Any repeat results, you need to calculate a mean. Graphs that have mean values plotted should also include the range bars, but remember, do not include any anomalies. Axes must be properly scaled, but they don't need to start at zero, and axes should ensure that the majority of the chart area is used for the graph, at least two thirds. So, I hope your graph skills are now going to be up to scratch. Make sure you're practicing graphs. This is really an area where practice makes perfect. So well done, and keep learning.